joining us. My name is Mark Northover. I work for the uh, I work for Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, and I'm a member of the Ascalite Executive Committee, and also working to um, uh, facilitate this webinar series. Partly, this particular webinar is um, brought about by a recently signed memorandum memorandum of understanding between Ascalite and Eden, the European Distance and E-Learning Network. Um, and I will invite Ildiko, who works for Eden in the UK, to talk a little bit that, about that in a second. And then we will pass over to Dinesh Zarko, who is an instructional designer for the University of Technology in Budapest, um, who will present the webinar. If you've got any um, uh, comments that you'd like to make, please put them in the chat uh, box and we'll monitor that as the session goes through. Um, if you wanted to speak, there's a hand raise icon where you can be invited to speak. Please uh, turn the microphone off if you're not speaking, just so that we don't get interference and background noise. Um, and so thank you, um, Eldico, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you very much for the word, Mark, and uh, good evening to everybody from the other side of the world, and uh, good morning to those few who are joining us from Europe. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be here at the, the first webinar uh, that is part of uh, this new partnership between Escalite and Eden. I would like to introduce uh, our organization uh, shortly. My name is Ildiko Mazar. I am the Deputy Secretary General of Eden, the European Distance and E-Learning Network. Our association is the most comprehensive uh, one in, in Europe. Uh, it is registered in the UK. Uh, we've been going for 25 years now. We just celebrated our 25th uh, anniversary. And uh, our goal is to uh, uh, promote uh, communication, collaboration, and to foster development of uh, open education, distance education, and e-learning and uh, to allow cooperation and information exchange uh, between our members. And uh, uh, I don't know if you can click on the link um, in the uh, shared presentation box, but if you would like to read more about the organization, you can click on the link there, www.edenonline.org. Uh, we are open to all uh, levels and sectors of education, whether it's a, uh, it is a formal or non-formal, informal, higher education, K-12, um, uh, just uh, continuous professional development um, for, for teachers and professors. And uh, we are open to institutions as well as individual members and networks such as Ascalite. We have several strategic partnerships uh, with other associations of that kind from uh, everywhere in the in the globe, really. And uh, another aim we have is to to recognize uh, uh, formally and informally uh, excellence and uh, professional achievements, and to to demonstrate that. Um, uh, one little example is that, for example, after this webinar, all uh, 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 participants of this webinar will be issued an open badge. And uh, those of you who know um, what open badges are will be able to just uh, accept it and add it uh, to their uh, backpacks. This webinar is going to be about the perspectives of the European uh, instructional designer. And uh, here I would like to hand over the microphone to my um, colleague, uh, to Dinesh Zarka uh, from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, who's going to introduce to you uh, how uh, instructional design works uh, here in Europe so that you can see how that compares to, to your practices in Australia and New Zealand. And if you have any questions about Eden, uh, at the end of the presentations, I'll be here to answer your questions, or you can just send us an email. Dinesh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eldiko. Um, a very good evening from Europe, and uh, especially from Central Europe, Budapest. A very quick self presentation. Um, although I'm an instructional designer nowadays, I'm uh, or originally an electrical engineer, graduated from Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Um, I was trained in the UK, especially in Sheffield, where there was the um, 
um, the department from for uh, employment department at that time. It, those departments are changing their name every five years or so, but at that time it was employment department. Um, till 1998, I was working for Budapest Training Technology Center, and then I was uh, recruited uh, in 1998 from to uh, my former university where I was graduating from, um, in the Learning Innovation Center, where I'm working still now. My field of expertise is course development, content development, educational research, training of designers and tutors. So most of the time I'm not teaching, I'm putting together nice uh, material. Just to know if anybody is familiar with this topic, is there any other instructional designers in the room? Just raise your hands, I'm quite interested. I, I will speak a little bit differently if there are. Okay, yes, at least one, thank you. So, um, so I'm not a teacher, but uh, I'm doing training for, for designers uh, with much uh, um, uh, exercises and experiencing things. Um, living in Europe, Hungary, Budapest, uh, I will show a map of this and um, um, I speak Hungarian, English and French. I still have some Russian from the dark era, but I would not like to try it out now. It was compulsory till 89 to learn. Okay, thank you. I think it's enough for presentation and go to the topic. Uh, yes, so it's a nice... Uh, I thought uh, uh, that we are approaching from Europe then uh, a nice map from Europe and in the middle this uh, little red something is Hungary, 10 million square kilometers, yes we are um, counting kilometers and uh, 10 million, less than 10 million inhabitants, capital is Budapest. Okay, I would like to ask, yes, thank you, that was my um, a request to to um, stop my uh, um, projection on a camera, which uh, help us quite a lot with the bandwidth. I will speak about a few things, open things, uh, because uh, there are many meanings of it. Is it really new? Um, uh, sharing and media convergence, differences in settings, Australia and EU, Whatever um, I know about this, I have a, um, a very surface type knowledge of Australian higher education, although I've always had very good uh, examples for distance education in, in Australia. Why would I design open content and why would you design open content? That will be the two questions I would like to answer. Um, and how does it turn to be sustainable? That's what will be the last idea I will speak of. So, the first bit of things I would like to speak of is uh, the past meanings of open. In the early 70s, 90s, open learning meant open access learning and when I learned open learning or distance education, in my diploma in England was uh, um, an expert of open and flexible learning. But that time it was purely access. We were speaking about, at that time, much about the time, pace and place when we opened up the access and uh, the, the closer we could uh, take the access to the learners and above all, for example, the free access to education, it was a very good new thing. So that was um, partly to breaking down the barriers. Somebody has turned my... I turn it back. Yes, thank you. Okay. So... Um, the access to courses, fee reduction, Somebody is always changing my slides. I don't know why. Okay, thank you. Um, so access to free co to courses, fee reduction, no more entry requirements. So, for example, in the British Open University, they decided not to um, require level A 
for after the secondary education. Eliminating strict evaluation methodologies, I was learning much that the, the free choice of learners or students to, to choose the way they are assessed and things like this. Open learning was individual paper and broadcast and video and audio and CBT based. A CBT at time, that time meant a computer based training. I don't know if anybody is familiar with this. And um, it has dis totally disappeared. I still have very good memories of some very good CBTs. Um, the media was quite expensive, so we were uh, concentrating much more on the methodological content. But the service and the content was not open and not free at that time. And as the technology goes by, the recent meanings of open uh, is a bit different. Open learning nowadays uh, is, is really about open content learning. Open educational resources in this res respect mean that open access of content, for example, articles, open source educational tools and Moodles, so even the tools with which you are producing the content is open and open practices where you um, offer open architectures of learning, individualized learning pathways and others, which is uh, also opened up. And open courses, yes, open online courses like MOOCs, MOOCs mostly uh, as a, the access is free only, which means that normally MOOCs are halfway open um, only the access, but they normally don't uh, give out the source code or, or the um, material in, in a native format, just the course itself. So if an instructional designer like me would like to, uh, um, to uh, research a bit on MOOCs, we uh, have to enroll as students and look around, otherwise it is not accessible. While, for example, if we are um, making a, an open educational resource course, then we most of the time give access to the resource to, to, be, to um, give the ability to edit the content itself. Anyway, different definitions in a recently published material uh, can be uh, observed. Um, the related project currently running, and we are just uh, finishing it, is the Open Prof project, Open Professional Collaboration for Innovation. There are three training materials, and I give the links as well, OER and Sustainability Model, that is the first training material which is open, ICT tools to develop and adapt OER, and I use it quite extensively, this second training material, even in my own university, for, for university academic staff who asked me to have them a little bit how they could make their own OERs. And I'm just showing from here some editing tools and others. And the third is innovative curriculum designing for work-based learning. You can click on the third one and you see those are quite short courses. So if you want to have a deep understanding, then you really have to take a bigger course. But for in the running life, if you have a, a few hours to, to uh, skim to get something and you have very quickly have to produce something as a teacher, it is uh, quite good for you. I stop here for a little while and asking you if we are, you are with me, if anybody has questions from this first OER part or can I go further? Yes, uh, no urgent matters I think, so, um, so I think I can uh, go forward. And I'm just finishing the topic by, is it really new? Uh, and I would say, no, it's not really new, because we have always talked about special design, special tools, special approach, special media, special role of teachers and tutor. And we still speak about new approaches. But um, in my experience, in the last 20 years, I experienced some changes that dramatically changed open learning. 
the two big things that are affecting or effective, uh, affected and uh, still affecting my designer like is the sharing and networking effect and the media access and convergence. Let's talk two to um, sentences about this or three sentences about this. Um, emailing home computers didn't mean methodological change. Web portal techniques like learning management systems, what is uh, also um, cited as virtual learning environments in other parts of the world. Um, VAM 2 point and sharing did do something uh, much more interesting. From individual learner to learner communities, cooperation and collaboration broke out from the minor experience position, mainstream activity, what we designers can build on. I clearly remember how we tried to motivate the solitude learners with their print materials to form their own learning groups and volunteer learning groups and how we ask them whether we can share their telephone numbers, whether they could call themselves, whether they could meet in libraries face to face and, and try to do some networking in, in uh, real terms, but it was marginal. Some people did, let's say five, ten people of, of learners did, but normally they didn't. And in this, in this need, we all, always knew that it would help a lot in the individual learning if, if learners can uh, volunteer in networking. At, that has arrived with Web, web 2.0 and the network computers. And the other thing which is new is a media access and convergence, which means that the publishing industry tools and products with film industry tools and products and telecom industry tools and products are converging and are in a convergence and everything is in your screen. Unfortunately, all the knowledge you had to know uh, of text publishing, film publishing and telecommunication are still there, so you more or less have to master all of this, but anyway, it is accessible from your screen and uh, desktop computer or laptop or tablet or whatever, and you can play with all of them, with the mix of them. And I think this mix is nicely come together uh, to uh, offer OERs. However, and I will stop at the end of this idea. I will ask you whether you are um, um, agreeing with me. There, are, there may be, can be possible cultural differences how we regard this openness of, uh, of uh, learning. Let's see this very nice um, matrix. And I would say that the, uh, the, the first issue is the language. I think or I have the vision that in Australia you can very easily live with your English language. But for us in Europe, most of us, English is um, a second language or something which we have learned in school. But we have much German, French, Spanish, Italian, Polish and many, many small languages like Hungarian, which means that the educational market is quite dramatically segmented. Of course, the higher the education level is, the more you can use the English, but in initial education, in, in, uh, in ISCAD level, low level VET, uh, you can't count that all Europeans speak English. So we are in a quite in a different situation and we quite intensively try to use techniques which are language free. Another interesting possible cultural difference is the business model itself. Because as my vision on Australia or New Zealand is that, that um, education and market and business oriented tuition fees are uh, on place, um, maybe relatively free and low, low regulation level. On the other hand, in Europe, the higher education by law is mostly free uh, apart from the UK, strongly regulated by the states, and there is quite a small free market uh, 
uh, it's it's limited to the corporate market uh, rather, and it's a big difference of the value of free content. Uh, therefore, we have to have some political drivers to make more and more uh, open uh, resources, because um, in the learning market, at least in, let's say, secondary and tertiary education, people quite easily find uh, a full-time free education for themselves if they are not living too far from a big city. And the scale of operation, this is the, the third uh, possible difference. Um, I think that Australia is a unique and big market with global outreach because of your culture, Anglo-Saxon culture and uh, global uh, and uh, language, while um, Europe is segmented, small market, limited outreach. Of course, there partly there are similar wakes that uh, you can experience in Australia, for example, Spanish colleagues are easily uh, contacted with Latin America with a big Spanish language. So, yes, Spanish in a way is global and can be uh, triggered and can be supplied with content from Spain or Portugal is the same. Fran France uh, is heavily working with the uh, Francophonie, so they are also global in this sense. But um, here or there, there are patches which are similar to Australia, but anyway, we can't speak a unique, one unique European market. Uh, although we have uh, more, in most of the, the countries, we have current, common currencies, but the, um, the uh, English is like the Latin in the medieval ages. This is only a transferring language. Yes, before going back, I'm just asking whether you are with me. Are there any questions about those? Are you agreeing with me that the, the Australian setting is quite different from the European one? And therefore, the value and the motivation of uh, offering open educational resources might be very different uh, in, in your universities or your institutions in, and in European institutions. Yes, Mark is raising hand. Um, I was just going to ask a question, um, Dennis, and maybe Eva might want to answer it. I take your point about Australia and New Zealand being in a position with what is probably a more globally acceptable language, working in English. But I'm always being told that um, on the west coast of Australia, in Perth, it's the same time zone as the east and coast of Asia. So there's a huge um, potential population there in China that is on the same time zone as um, the, western, the west coast of Australia. Eva, do you know whether universities in Perth are developing specialised Chinese language um, resources and education materials? Eva, I'm not sure if you heard that question. Can you um, indicate whether you have an answer? And maybe in due course, Dennis, maybe you um, okay. carry on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Have you ever faced such cultural differences in my career? Yes, certainly. And within the English language, um, it, um, my nicest um, um, cultural difference uh, was um, my second um, um, course. I tried to um, um, translate and adapt to Hungarian in the early 90s where the, the British um, um, computer-based material was explaining um, the choice of a new product in a, 
in a, a, a shop and uh, we tried to teach the, the, the uh, a technique how you can select for if you have let's say six point of points uh, to select and how you rank it and so on but unfortunately the, the good the uh, the object we were talking about was a kettle uh, but in Hungary nobody used kettle 20 years ago uh, we all had uh, we just heated the, the um, boil the water with uh, special tea cans and so we had to adapt and we just changed the kettle to um, an espresso coffee maker because normally nobody could have any questions how to choose a kettle from the Hungarian shops without any um, knowledge about a kettle but uh, yes it's, it's uh, partly a joke but even in Europe uh, the different life settings the, life is more global now but at that time even with those minor things we had to um, face it but um, I certainly I certainly see a big cultural difference between the Anglo-Saxon way of business-like thinking and, um, and product and customer-oriented way of thinking while the continental, I would not like to uh, mention all the colleagues, but Italian, German, French uh, academics who are more on the quality and academic side and are not dealing so heavily with the need of supplying the, the, the learners, the students. They, they still think that the high quality um, educational material is self-explanatory and uh, students themselves uh, have to think of it as a big uh, possibility and fortune that they have freely have the free right to listen to them and I think culturally in the continent is still quite common uh, even with younger lecturers while I, I saw in the UK that most of the, the academic people um, apart from the highest rank um, lecturers, they are very keen on teaching and not telling content. Uh, I think, for example, this is a cultural difference within Europe and w with, which comes from these col possible cultural differences. Therefore, open educational resources to make one is not very easy in Europe. Okay, let's go further. And uh, Ildiko is raising hand. Is it is it uh, really um, something? I'm just stopping Ildiko. Yes, uh, I, I just wanted to reflect on what you said about the uh, the cultural differences. You mentioned uh, Latin America, and uh, just uh, remember that we uh, we had uh, an, another European Union funded project that was uh, developing uh, uh, language courses for for businesses in Portuguese. And what I do remember is that, uh, for example, the um, the Brazilian version of the course, and this was very very short uh, anime. Uh, videos and the vocabulary that the, the Portuguese and the, the Brazilian versions of the same uh, unit uh, taught was very different because the, the cultural approach to a business conversation in, in Portugal and in Brazil were very different. The, the Brazilians were more friendly, they were more uh, physical, they would be asking about your family, while in, in Portugal the, the business conversations were more strictly business related. And uh, I, w I was quite fascinated by the fact that those people who developed these courses, although they were both um, Portuguese language for business, uh, they had to take into account uh, the encounters uh, of uh, the, the two business partners. Uh, and uh, so this is just uh, another example for for the cultural differences and how the instructional designer has to take them into account to reach the same effect. Thank you, Ildiko. I experienced the same. So we have to be very cautious. Uh, so when we um, build up the skeleton of a course, um, the small things that we are enriched uh, with those courses have to be carefully designed and sometimes change if it is a different cultural environment for exercises, activities, group work and other may die out if, if different cultural settings uh, 
come um, on the scene and uh, sometimes I'm just um, I'm just making sure that the, the course itself is uh, stupid free which means that if all the communication fails I even have some tests and some activities that can be done still in solitude and no excuses that they couldn't talk with anyone uh, or at least not a meaningful conversation. So yes, uh, we have to be very cautious in this uh, matter and I had the same uh, experience that Ildiko with Portuguese and uh, Brazilian different culture, although the same language, I experienced a very nice Portuguese lecture in Sao Paulo when the half of the audience was laughing because the lady, the academic lady, uh, whom they normally loved, the, the wording and the style of Portuguese, they told me uh, silently that this is a medieval age uh, language. So for them it was ridiculous how the lady was talking. So then, then I realized that, that you have to be cautious whom to invite, how to invite and how you uh, direct them to talk. So it was more or less a failure, uh, traveling and flying 10 hours from, uh, from Portugal to Sao Paulo to, to um, lecture on something that the people can, just can't access because they are stopped uh, with, the, with the wording. Uh, of the same language because yes they also told that we are more familiar more democratic and not so aristocratic and also the wording was okay I, I didn't understand that uh, by the way I just um, I just uh, experienced the ambience of the uh, Sao Paulo audience in the university thank you and let's go further a little bit why would I design open content and my dramatic answer is I would not, but I'm in a special position. I'm making the giving of designing, so like the tailors from tailing and teachers from teaching. So uh, I normally, uh, maybe one of these academic stuff that I would not design because I'm the designer, but all other colleagues uh, are free to do this. And also, because it is time-consuming, I still count 40 hours of designing time of preparation for one hour uh, good quality online learning. And um, I think, uh, so I was two or three times in my life was thinking of making over open content for my family, but I just dropped it. And um, then I uh, spoke with a painter in my flat and when he reported the same that he would never paint his flat on his own but normally what he does is inviting the colleagues and do the same techniques in their his own setting that uh, he does in professional settings and in three or five days he is painting his own uh, flat uh, uh, with uh, six other people uh, it is more an option than to do it on your own so this is partly the reason I'm, um, I'm not doing uh, the, um, the online uh, open design on my free time uh, to, to anything. But I design most of the time open courses for learning because the, the public finals of the course, uh, so it is free for the beneficiary but not free for the financer. And always follow the financial requirements. So, for example, in social science, if I have a customer uh, to de design something, if it is social science, it is more on open side. If it's technical science, like in my university, it's more on the restricted side. Just, um, just one example, if a big uh, car industry player orders um, an e-learning material for um, further education, uh, uh, internal further education, it is absolutely forbidden to put it online because the, uh, the uh, other car manufacturers would also learn from this and it is definitely not their aim. But also, um, if it's public financing, it's open side because the European public funding is, is requiring more and more open uh, uh, hands uh, and put the cards on the table while business financing is on the restricted side and I'm clearly remember that I 
had the um, the chance to work uh, to work for insurance companies and i had a designing contract that i even couldn't quote that i was working for them because they told me it was more than 10 years ago that's why i'm talking about now um in relation to openness um uh, 10 years ago there was so big fluctuation in the um in the agents um cohort that it cost a very big money for an, an insurance company to train and train new and new um, agents who uh, do the um, the business and um, um, and um, offer new and new contracts. So the insurance company who decided to do it online quickly and cheaply didn't want to hear that other concurrents also do the same technique. So for them it was a golden solution and uh, it was strictly forbidden to talk about this work and it was not defense industry it was pure uh, fi uh, financing industry and uh, insurance industry um, of course the uh, the setting has changed and it is not the same uh, it was a very big um, um, a peak at that time in this business and now it is more settled. I'm just telling two uh, things. One is the uh, social science versus um, uh, technical science and public versus business where you really uh, ex experience different uh, um, requirements uh, of the level of openness and yes if it's social science and yes if it's public finance I'm designing open content, even open resource content uh, for the Hungarian or European public. I'm stop here also because it, ca it can be something that uh, you don't agree, so if you have any um, questions about this openness, uh, I'm ready to discuss with you. But if not, then I'm continue. I'm just showing one screenshot <clears throat> from this open prof thing. Um, the the um, the link is there, and uh, uh, it it was already um, uh, shared by Ildico, the the major um, link to this um, um, portal. This is cut out from a Moodle portal. This is Mobility Guide Online Planning and Management with ICT support. That was financed, for example, of, um, by the European Union. Therefore, the requirement is to open it up. So you are, uh, after an enrollment, uh, you are free to learn this material. The resource in, with our course is not totally uh, uh, open because we are there are some links that uh, and there there are some internal things that we would not like that the authors change but most of the courses that our colleagues our partner institutions uh, offered is free even in the resource code now the um, next slide uh, is why you as an academic or teacher uh, would you design an open content and for uh, my answers are quite simple because uh, your income is based on other indicators like classes, learner outcome, success rate etc and not on uh, the designed uh, materials so uh, your core activity is not uh, by developing courses your core activity I suppose is rather on teaching you may also that that's why you are more free to to create for your own um, uh, in your own free time some open content but you may also want to save time and energy for colleagues let's say you are working in a group uh, even with other universities and you decide to share um, uh, the, the development of different examples or case studies and you just share and put together and you save energy for yourself and for your colleagues as well. 
the free reuse of your content adds to your own reputation and i uh, and it is partly uh, um, the reason of the usa moocs that uh, the lecturers who offer freely their courses would um, uh, for really add to their reputation their names will circulate and uh, um, this free sharing would add at the end of the day um, to their academic career. Next, when it is a content made by your learner or learner groups, it, in case they agree and you build on your local repository of user-generated content. So, um, so in many cases, and also in social science, if you can build in, in your courses, that your learners themselves create content and you agree with them that they share with your classmates or they share with their other faculty members or even if they share with the big public, then uh, you would just have them to generate open content. I've heard in soci sociology departments that, for example, they started in Europe to gather um, uh, storytelling techniques, uh, second world war uh, uh, experiences of still living generation and they agreed not only to do the storytelling interviews but also they agreed that uh, the Spanish colleagues would put it online uh, in favor to the next generation. It was absolutely open content that was for educational purposes uh, and it was not created solely, solely by the, the, um, the, the tutors and teachers. They were, were just um, um, moderating the process and maybe editing the content, but the content was coming from elderly people who uh, were in elderly classes and learning something uh, in their pensioner time. It was just an example how you how learners uh, may generate uh, user generated content that may become an open content in your university. Another example was what I know of uh, also um, it was a psychology department and learners could find easily family stories about uh, different uh, social um, facts that they learn of and they made small case studies about those things in their en environment and they shared with each other and it was more likely um, that, they, uh, that they share and they learn from it than an, an academic example. And finally, when you think the open attitude adds something important to the learning community. So if you want to teach the openness, then also you have to share openly something with your learners, with your um, peer academic colleagues. Right. Uh, I think I stop here because uh, somebody is writing. Um, I'm asking Ildiko whether it's wise to stop now and uh, what is exactly the question. We can definitely stop here uh, and uh, see what the question is. About. It's more of a comment than a question, really. Okay. Yes, yes, I agree with that, but absolutely. Just I saw that uh, that was about cultural differences as well, that this is an attitude now we take in Europe, and uh, but in business environments, uh, it is quite strange for them till now. But also, I would not say it is black and white. Maybe not um, a very good example, but Nokia in the last 10 years, they, they uh, started to... Um, to uh, introduce in Nokia an internal company's policy of openness, even with um, even with uh, new technology and even with innovation, they opened it up internally and to the whole world, and they had a belief that it will globally help Nokia to become uh, more uh, on the uh, on the innovative edge. Um, as far as I see, the, um, the um, marriage with uh, 
Microsoft uh, slowed it dramatically down, but I, I also know that uh, this period will end up soon and they come back to their original Finnish way of thinking. Okay. So how does it become sustainable if we open it up? And there are also some answers, like with massive financing on behalf of the University of Public Funding, and but that's what is happening in Europe nowadays with Erasmus Plus programs, when where the uh, open uh, open educational content and resources are a political priority. So uh, you have much more chance to get funding to any kind of uh, educational activity if you. Um, agree that you will open up uh, your content. With substantial input on behalf of authors, yes, uh, it's, it is sometimes uh, requiring much uh, time and energy on your behalf, but with a good choice of content, ideal for reuse, edit and remix, which means that Sustainable content is, a, is more, most of the time, global content with, with um, small uh, cultural uh, differences. For example, um, let's say how this or that product works. It is a quite um, uh, cultural independent thing. So if you prepare a how to do open educational content on something, then then it's easy to translate, edit, and remix without too much uh, um, cultural problems. With a good answer to emerging needs, which means that although the, even in, um, in Europe where the, uh, the legislation is quite strict, if you find an emerging field where there is no content at all, uh, you can start with an open uh, uh, choice, an open content choice, uh, where there is no still a uh, subject which is teaching them, and you will be uh, the front breaker of this uh, new field with open content uh, right from the beginning. And also with a good choice of an industry standard format. So if you're creating something in a format that only um, was developed in your university, in your company. Um, we may speak about special, let's say, um, picture um, uh, digitizing technology or special voice technology or special LMS or so. If it's very specialized, that it will not be a good open content. If you use the, the, the nowadays uh, industry standard, that you can be sure that if this uh, industrial standard is already over, then somebody will make sure that there is a kind of compatibility to the um, next industry standard. While if you are using your own um, custom standard, it will not transfer if you, do, you don't do it on your own. And I clearly remember in the 90s where, um, for example, in documents there was no doc format and we used a very different format. Nowadays, the only way out from this that we um, try to open with the old word processors and uh, save it in text format and then reload it modern word processors and edit the characters and uh, a huge work has to be done to at least see the text itself. It wouldn't happen if you are um, using JPEG format and PDF format and doc format and those, uh, or M, let's say in, in motion video it's MPEG 4, then it's most probably that the next generation industry um, viewers will, uh, uh, will be also um, have the possibility to import it. Those are, those are the, the, the factors that I think uh, that, uh, that the sustainability uh, related uh, to the sustainability. Are there any questions about the sustainability or are any, any views on this? I'm just, yes, uh, this is the end. So um, um, are there any questions of anything I was uh, talking about? Um, 
even the last slides or any part of the presentation I, I was just um, putting on the table. I'm uh, happy to discuss it with you. I see that Ildiko and Eva have a, um, quite an intensive uh, discussion in the chat box, so I shut up for the moment. I give the floor back to Ildiko uh, if there is any conversation. She or Mark could uh, moderate it. Thank you. And thank you for your uh, uh, listening to me. Thank you very much, Dana. This was most inspirational. I always uh, appreciate the, the practical examples uh, behind the uh, narrative. So I hope the others felt the same way. And uh, this is now the open floor where we still have five minutes plus the delay time. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, just uh, switch on your microphone and feel free to. Um, Ildiko, I was just wondering, I see that Dominic Parrish has joined our session, and Dominic is the president of Ascolite. Um, I wondered if Dominic might like to just say a word on behalf of Ascolite and the Eden um, collaboration. That would be great. Uh, Dominic, can you turn on your microphone? Sorry, I can you hear me? I'm here. I can. Yes. You can, great. Sorry, Mark, you were really faint. Every time you've come in I've had to turn my microphone my um audio up very loud because I couldn't hear you. But I think you've asked me if I would uh, give a vote of thanks to Dean um, for the this afternoon to Dean for uh, taking the time and for such an interesting presentation. I'm pretty sure that's what you wanted me to do. Yeah. Great, yes. So um, it, it was a very interesting presentation and I know it got me thinking about my own personal context, more so I must say than Ascolite. And um, I noticed that one of my team are actually in the forum today, so it's going to be interesting to talk to him about it tomorrow. Um, thank you very much, Dean, for your, um, you know, the time that you've taken to present the information that you've presented here today. I'm not sure if anyone else, I don't want to take up anyone else's time who might have a question for him. No questions? If, if people are just shy, please feel free to put your comments in the, the chat box and I can read them out or uh, Danish can read them and answer them. I see Eva's uh, uh, microphone on and now off. Uh, Eva, did you want to ask a question? If you are speaking, I'm afraid we, we, we cannot hear you, but I see that your microphone is on and off. And now David's uh, microphone is on, so let's see what he Well, we, we talked about, you talked about sustainability in terms, can you hear me? Yeah, can you can hear me? Okay. We, we, you talked about sustainability in terms of open educational resources, but um, I'm curious about your perspectives on sustainability from the standpoint of um, being a designer in the context that you're in, sort of the efforts that, that you're taking um, to establish a sustainable model for um, constructing educational resources, um, what, sort of what, what's your approach when you're working with folks to design these resources? Thank you. Um, um, my approach is quite down to earth. Um, 
first, I'm, I'm designing open source for the public if uh, the public uh, public resources are available for me. So um, I'm not complaining uh, the last 10 years or more to, to design uh, open resources. It becomes sustainable if in the leading in process and in, in, if in the dissemination process we can make a big breakthrough with the material. In fact, what book is now used to be um, um, technically available from the beginning of the, of the, the millennium. So, but what, whatever I designed to and offered free and put on my um, website free, Nobody used it because there was a lacking model of, of, of dissemination and embedment to the educational process. So, on one hand, uh, we are quite free to, uh, and happy to offer things freely, but the sustainability will become if the society or part of the society, uh, which means now the learning community or university community, taking it up and builds in their curricula or builds in their day-to-day -day life. That is one. The other thing, uh, the real big thing with MOOCs is, uh, for example, is th this business model, how they tried to make um, sustainable this free offering model by two, three uh, special effects, uh, which we call, for example, loss leading model or freemium model or other models that are helping them that even if they are investing much in a quality content that at the end of the day in a few years time they get back the investment in other ways not cheating on the fact that they are offering things free. Um, just uh, one very short and last example in the UK there are professions where the master's diploma is uh, a value. So they offer freely the bachelors and uh, uh, gather the money at the master's level. So um, there are some, uh, even in, in, in business settings, there are some business models how you can... Um, oh, hi Carol, how are you? Carol, would it be possible for us to now run it tomorrow? That's my husband uh, mm -hmm. Can, uh, Gabor, can you please mute the, the microphones of the, uh, the people? I can do it. Is that okay? Hi. Okay, somebody is talking. Uh, okay. So, this is my, my answer that uh, our approach is as a designer that if, uh, if my customer uh, orders an open educational content, then I will do. If my, if my university teacher um, peer asks me if then I, I help them uh, how that they, they can design and I try to make sure that any content which is designed and put online is used by the society. Otherwise, this open content will be um, an o uh, only a theoretically open content if nobody is learning it. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. Uh, any other questions from anybody else? I think we might still have uh, time for a question or two. And if not, actually, I, I don't know that according to the script uh, who should uh, close the, the session, but uh, I would definitely like to thank uh, Danish for uh, his time early in the morning for the presentation and Ascalite, uh, Mark and Dominic uh, for the opportunity and if the presenter or our host would like to say uh, another few words then uh, this is me saying uh, thanks and goodbye Goodbye everybody and have a nice evening in Australia